<laughs> All right, Karma, first published in The Liberator in September of 1922. We're back with Cain by Gene Toomer. Now, what kind of karma is this? Is it with a C or with a K? Mm, it's the C karma, referring to a young lady in this. Now, with that said, you're back with us. You've missed a couple of the poems, but you'll notice that the four-line stanza uh, kind of makes an appearance at the beginning, middle, and end of this story. What'd you think of that? I like how it gives it like this rhythm. Uh, I like how that it kind of sets a tone through the entire poem. Again, you know, I struggle with poetry, but if there's a... a a rhythm to it, or if it is almost like mathematical, uh, my brain can kind of digest it a little bit easier. Any thoughts about how it talks about how the wind blows through the sugar cane and this repeats itself throughout the poem? Like, th did, did it give you any feelings about repetition or about how we're moving through a story in a sense? Yeah, it felt like that it was setting the stage, of course, but it, it kept making me feel like this must be really, really important. Otherwise, why would you repeat it? Uh, that repetition seemed to add a layer of, I don't know, sensuality or like it, it just it, it hit home to me of, hey, this is going to be important to understanding who this young lady is. So one of the things that was happening in some of the other poems is they talked about crops and sugar cane, bull weevils come in, right? And cane was a big Southern American crop at the time. And one of the things that I kind of got this feeling for is how we move through, wind moves through the cane, right? In the same way that like we as readers are passing through these stories at just lightning speeds. You know what I mean? Like this, this was like what, two pages in, in my print version? And it happens lightning fast, but it still feels so complete, even though we're brushing through like like wind through a young girl's hair. Here we are brushing through this this woman's life karma, but we get a lot of um, of a glimpse into it very quick, I would say. Oh, yeah. Toomer does a great job of pulling you into the story quickly. And then not only that, giving you almost not overwhelmingly so but there's an info dump on karma and her life and her husband and what she's going through and her struggles and why they're all happening and then unfortunately you know you don't really get a resolution but it does leaving you hoping that karma's fate is a good one right well fate fate's an interesting question when it, especially when the title of this is called karma which means that like the the deeds that we do in our life will impact kind of what our next life's going to be like, the, the rebirth. I mean, a lot of people think of it as what goes around comes around, but karma is really a, a next life thing, right? Do, putting out the good energies for the future life. But then even the man's name, Bane, <laughs> that, seems, <laughs> that seems like a very specific, like that. what does that mean? Like uh, an annoyance or, or utterance? All of I know is it has a negative connotation every time I think of like the bane of existence. And I feel like that this guy, her husband, is the bane of her existence. All of her problems can be laid at his feet and verse, vice versa, probably from his viewpoint. Usually when you describe something as a great annoyance, it ain't a good thing. So here's, here's her husband, the great annoyance. <laughs> so the first... But, so we have like the, the, the opening four state lines, the middle four lines. And in between that, we have the introduction of karma. A woman who is described as, as mannish, that her features are strong, right? She's compared a lot to masculine energy. And what's really strange about how what, what Toomer does with this is almost like two thirds of this entering line, like a quarter of the whole short story here are in these parens, you know, like these parentheses where... It's almost like these sights, these sounds, what she hears, the sun beating down, how it makes her skin feel. It's all these sensory things where it almost like invites the reader in to almost put themselves in karma's shoes even. As I was reading this, I could feel the sunshine on my face. I could smell the farm. It took me back to a very pleasant uh, feeling, I guess. Uh, I lived on a farm off and on throughout my life, so it definitely immersed me in this. And I love that, the, the uh, yellow flower face. You can just imagine the bright sunshine on her face just glowing off. She's radiant, maybe got a little bit of sheen of sweat on her. And you, you can imagine that yourself on a, a bright, sunshiny day, you know, pounding down on your face. It's wonderful imagery. Now, the second part opens up with her husband in the gang. Do you know what that means? 
I was assuming this was a chain gang. Uh, back in the day, they would chain prisoners together so that they couldn't run away. And I'm thinking that he was a criminal because he did something bad. I took it as like the opening was, okay, he's in the chain gang. And then it describes what led him to that. Right. So, so, well, I guess technically it said he was, he was traveling a lot. And as a result, I guess karma decided to cheat on him with other men. Right. She was, she was sleeping around with other men. And it's not described very straightforward. Right. It says working with a contractor, he was away most of the time. She had others. No one blames her for that. He returned one day and hung around the town where he picked up weak old boasts and rumors. Bane accused her. She denied. Right. So, so very quickly, it's like these, these very quick, like almost monosyllabic ways of putting things of, you know, she denied she was away, like very quick ways of describing that since he was, I get the sense neglecting her, that she felt justified in cheating on him with other men around time in, in a town, allegedly accused, and she denies it when he calls her out on it. Yeah, when I read it, I guess I thought, is he just accusing her? Do we actually definitively know that she has cheated on him? For me, I didn't take it as straightforward fact that she had, and he's just accusing and she denies. It's, we just know it from Bane's perspective that he's heard rumors that this is what she's done. I guess maybe I I read it out of order in my brain. I, I don't know. Uh, I Do you think the shortness of how Toomer has this delivered to us as a reader adds to like the rumor element? Like with rumors, they're not all formed. You know what I mean? It's not complete sentences. It's like, well... This is what I know. I've seen them do this before. So that means they probably are like this. And here you have very abbreviated ways of phrasing what is ultimately a very intimate and probably heated moment in their exchange in their lives. Oh, so the mechanic of the sentences being short themselves is emulating the idea of a lot of times we don't have the entire story when we have a rumor or a piece of a story. Wow, that that's right. that's some next level writing right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I I, I absolutely think this entire book is just a masterpiece. But she, what we do know is she runs away with a gun, and he's kind of giving chase, or you know, the, the gun goes off, and he's like, okay, well, um, I'm gonna need a posse before I follow up with this. <laughs> so he gets a group. <laughs> yeah, anytime of I'm men. chasing my wife, I gotta go get friends when she shoots at me. Sure. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not going after her alone when she's taking <laughs> shots at me. <laughs> Maybe it's time to reevaluate that relationship and forego the posse. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Now, now we're searching for her and it's starting to be twilight like they mentioned torches now, so I think it's getting dark and we discover the body and there's this quote here where it says time and space have no meaning in a cane field. What does that mean? I think it's because they're endless. If you, you go to a farm, you just see the rows and rows of corn or wheat or cane, and it just it gives you this sense of, I don't want to say dread, but just never ending, that it, mm. it's timeless, which is mm -hmm. not like a lot of people think of like timeless as like a good thing, but almost like a, a bad thing. Does it ever give you a feeling of like, we, like people, have been through this before? Like, like... Time has no meaning, space has no meaning. Like, this is all stuff that's happened before in terms of these local marital problems, the chasing, the violence, the anger. Uh, and it's all you know, like, like, went through a cane field, right? Like, that stands that repeats itself. And then talking about how time and space have no meaning here, right? Like, the, the fact that these are things that just kind of seem to happen. It, it gave me this almost like Twilight Zone feeling of just like, yeah, this is kind of how lives happen. In America, sometimes. Yeah, that's a that's a good way of thinking about that. That Twilight Zone feeling. I guess it just reiterates that idea of the human tragedy that we are sometimes the worst to the ones that we love, or we pretend to love, or convince ourselves that we we truly love. Should have seen that coming by hanging out with a dude named Bane, right? <laughs> <laughs> no offense to any Bane viewers out there, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Dog but Bane. In instead, they find her body, right? And they bring her back. And that's when they find out she's alive. I and I wanted to ask you about this quote. It says, a curious, nosy somebody looked for the wound. This fussing with her clothes, 
aroused her. What does that mean? The aroused her? Because it could mean, I'm curious, that it woke her up. It could mean, you know, she's the woman that is going around with other men. That it aroused her, that other men were interested in her. How did you take that line? Yeah, I definitely thought that it was probably more meant to be the sexualized kind of way of thinking of that she likes this attention that she's getting. And that's probably one of the reasons why her husband is so upset. Uh, But I mean, I think either way could be interpreted, of course, but that's the way that I read it. Okay. With that said, Kane specifically calls her as being mannish, like the, they're describing her as like the prototypical masculine attributes. Why, like if we look at the stories, so you've done a lot of the, the prose pieces so far. I know you've missed some of the poetry, but when you look at Carantha, it's a young girl who is romanticized, open to sexual things, probably a little bit too young. And it kind of changed her life with how she flew through life, went through through the cane field. You had Becky, right? who had uh, affairs with a man of the opposite race, right? So she had mixed children, which ended up them being kind of rejected from town. But it's like, Tumor is putting women as being like, I almost like identified by their sexual choices. What does this one mean that she's sleeping around town with other men? She's being aroused by other men. And then to describe her as manly even, like, wh- like where do you where do you take that? I feel like it was kind of a contradiction, right? I mean, he describes her as manly, yet she is very sensual, and uh, a lot of the descriptors are very, very things that are in-natured, and yet then he calls her mannish, but uh, if she's sleeping around, a lot of these guys are, are you know, obviously attracted to her, uh, so I thought it was kind of odd, but I guess what it comes down to is that uh, that human element character that you know she must be likable uh maybe it isn't so much like a physical attraction thing uh but i don't i don't know okay yeah it was hard for me to understand what that could possibly mean right because particularly i mean the 1920s things were thought of much differently there in terms of what a man should be versus what a woman should be right and a lot of modern times are challenging what that means but he still puts her as this object defined against sexuality, defined against her sexual choices. And it doesn't seem to me like she's having any problems with attraction and and getting some of the male attention, if you will. It arouses her even potentially, depending on how you interpret that line. Yeah, I guess so. Like the different characteristics is that Bane is allowed to be jealous. Bane is allowed to be angry at her. Bane is allowed to take these things out. And obviously, you know, he gets in trouble for this and gets thrown on the chain gang. Uh, But it almost feels like a tumor is saying that the women of the time period weren't allowed to be anything other than these, you know, glorified sexual objects. You know, and that's a good point, because even to today. Women can get away with a lot in terms of violence, in terms of just beating the crap out of the man, right? It's very rare that women are held accountable for that level of violence. What does that mean that they discover her? And then Bane like slashes the guy instead of her. Like He takes the violence out on the man, and then he's the one that has to go to jail. He's the one that's punished. Like, are we supposed to be asking, should he be punished? Like, Like, where is karma's punishment? If we go back to her name and the title of the story, karma, what goes around comes around, like like you reap what you sow, something along those lines. What does it mean that he's the one that's punished? He's the one that made the choices, but she also made some questionable choices here too. Like, yet she's the one that doesn't seem to have any form of punishment in the story, I don't think. Yeah, she gets to go on like the wind and the cane, right? (laughs) She just gets to flow on with her rest of her life. And there are, I guess, no negative consequences. Maybe she truly loved her husband. And, you know, not having him around uh, is a a detriment to her life. We we really don't know. But it it is uh, perplexing that she kind of, quote, gets away with it. Because I don't think that was typical of really what truly happened in the 1920s in, in the South. Yeah. Well, we know that it was very different back then. Um, Even now, like you can't just mention like, oh, this is what the black diaspora experience is, right? Like, like it's so wide and varied out there. But interesting because, you know, Gene Toomer claimed to have 
lots of ethnicities and lots of background to him. He, he's a very complicated man, and I think that complicates his writing. And there's a very interesting line in here where it says, She is in the forest, dancing. Torches flare. Juju men. Gree gree. Witch doctors. Torches go out. The Dixie Pike has grown from a goat path in Africa. So these are very physical things. These are part of bringing in the kind of like the black African uh, heritage culture sort of side of things. Are we supposed to be thinking about this at all in terms of, you know, the, this woman's choices? We're condemning and saying what's right or wrong from a societal standpoint, right? Societal standards might be different here in terms of what does fertility mean for us here in America, in the South and Georgia, as opposed to Africa even, or uh, Latin American countries. I know they celebrate fertility and even had fertility uh, pillars and stuff that they would they would focus on. Like, where does judgment and these standards come from? And I think they come from society, and here we are using those society standards to judge these characters even. And I think it's the change of societal judgment or whatever we use today, or maybe not today, but back then, that America warped the African ideals of relationships. And Toomer is saying, you know, to be African is one thing, to be a African American or, or a black American, a person of color is going to be something entirely different. And our, our heritage is not the same anymore. Uh, and I, I think that that I think that that is he, he's way far ahead of his time thinking about, you know, what does it mean to be an American? It, it, it has nothing to do with your skin color because your skin color is irrelevant uh, to, to who you are. And I think that it kind of comes out in this of, you know, that African spirituality and the religion and all of those things. Does that matter to these people? Uh, because your Americanness is going to probably have more of an impact on you than who your ancestors were three or four hundred years ago. I'm gonna let's go back to something you said there because I know I know you didn't mean this, but let's double click on it just for the purpose of you know public video and everything. You said to be African is one thing, but we know that's not true, right? Because you had Christian Islamic areas of of Africa. You had you had different local African beliefs and stuff like that. Like there's no one unified experience, which, which is I, I think what you, you were saying there. And that, unified yeah, I guess experience just looking at, yeah, yeah. It doesn't even align with when you transport that, port that over here, particularly during, you know, if you look at what, what, what big sugar did, right. We took people, you know, Africans out of their lands, brought them to America. And then, forced American standards upon them, forced American expectations upon them about how they should act, and then judged them based on those standards that they didn't even agree to, in a sense. Oh, yeah, and we pushed the religion and new names and, and clothes and everything upon them. Yeah, I guess I was trying to say the fact that, like, that one factor won't be a defining characteristic because it is so complex of all the things that you mentioned as well. We're over halfway through the first section. There's kind of like three main sections what is Cain so far to you? Like, what what is this book pushing the boundaries of? Why why do people think it's a masterpiece? I think it evokes emotion. I think that it makes you question yourself, and I think that it makes you question relationships. And I mean, that's I mean, that's what we have, right? I mean, that's what I think most of us would agree that is important in life is all the relationships that we build. And it, it's talking about what are the nuances of those relationships? And how do we foster positive relationships? Or why do we see as some relationships as negative? And I feel like this whole book is just, it's taking people and their relationships and putting them in these tough situations. And some of them just don't ever get out. And I think it's kind of trying to be in this teachable moment of don't make these mistakes. You can be better. You can have better relationships than, than what these people did back in the day. We can be better now in how we treat one another and, and be in a relationship with somebody, whether it be friend, family, uh, loved one, etc. All right. Coming up next, Song of the Sun. And what was it, Georgia Dusk? Like, it's actually some of the longer poems. And after that is Fern, which you'll see that they're, they're going to start to expand. Right? We've had complete but short narrative so far. We're going to start expanding it. Let's see how that changes your view on YouTuber's <laughs> writings. My name's Benuna. Peace out. Peace.